So in, when I write about the natural world, um, sometimes you can choose what you want to write about. Sometimes something just occurs to you and you know you've got to write about that and you don't really have to search for it. And the, I thought to start with the first, um, the first poem is Earth Shakes out a hawk owl and it's the um, cow with the owl on the front of the book um, this is a photograph that I took of an owl in Phuket and when I lived there um, you don't really get that many earthquakes or you know other sort of extreme uh, weather unlike Anna in the Philippines um, for instance but there were about three earthquakes in short succession and one day when I got back from work in school this owl was in the tree in the garden and it was obviously daytime and it shouldn't have been there and I thought well this is one of those moments that you need to write about so earth shakes out a brown hawk owl is the poem that inspire is inspired by that encounter midday was heavy like a solid place heat flashing catfish fables up from the lake and in the slow rhythm of the hours, the world hiccuped. A new bird flew out of the rift, settled in the fork of a tree, shocked to wash up in the raucous truth of day. Yellow scaled talons hooked the fulcrum of the branch, shine like the end of thorns. Its beak kept tucked until needed to rip the skin off some beast. Seven vague hearts pinned its chest and wings folded neat as linen round the grey checkered vest. The tail lay trimmed smooth as a sail, waiting for the right wind. Locked on the lens of their own disbelief, two headlight eyes switched to full beam shone on a shaken earth. Like parallel satins, yellow as an egg, in the shift, some wondered about how we live, unable to feel the grain of nature, owls out of our time, waiting for the muted senses to waken. So that was the owl encounter. And um, yes, it was, it was an encounter with a, a bird and lots of my poems tend to have birds, animals, insects, and uh, creatures in whether the poem is about them or whether they just end up being in there as a symbol or a metaphor but uh, um, I do garden as well and I heard Janice earlier on saying that you're a gardener and I think it goes hand in hand with writing somehow to be in touch with the natural world and to um, appreciate what nature has to offer and um, one of the things that was strange for me was moving and living overseas and and being a gardener you have to sort of readjust your your um, knowledge and awareness of plants and um, kind of change your habits as well and learn about what grows and what doesn't grow and so on um, and I was very lucky that uh, in Singapore which doesn't often and offer people a garden to have. We did have a little garden where we lived and um, we grew plants there. And this next poem is about a flower that grows in Singapore called Heliconia. I think it probably grows somewhere else, but again, I probably only learned about it whilst I was living there. Um, this poem though also involves um, something that I'm, I'm quite fond of doing, which is looking into the etymology of the name of, of plants and something that I attribute probably to my dad because he was a gardener before I was born. He used to work in a, a public garden in, in Salford in Manchester, actually. Um, and so he was always trying to teach me that he always knows the nomenclature for the, the plants and everything. And I, I think that it stayed with me. Um, I don't know how, but it's it stayed in my mind. And so I do know a lot of the, the sort of Latin names for plants and so on. And anyway, the Heliconia, as lots of people will, will already know, um, has echoes of the the Greek myth of Helios. And I actually didn't know about that until I was researching the poem. So Heliconia, this is a sort of conversation now with, with me talking to a flower. Um, impossible stalk in the bed, you hold still, upright, when the hot wind pushes breath against your ribs. Head aloof, a fire blush fades, cools to a green neck 
that angles for a kiss from a honey bird like nectar, a fish that wishes for the hook. You look like a crest of yellow tusks sprouting from a gaping mouth. Trios of blunt teeth guard your crown, your wreath of radiance. Look how your wings uplift days perennially. False bird of paradise, flightless angel. What made you sing and burn in my garden like a god of some mythical mountain or a little chariot of sunbeams? So that's my homage to the, the humble Heliconia. Um, so yeah, so plants and uh, fruit and vegetables, all sorts of things crop up in the poems that are to do with the natural world. And um, this next poem, um, I have to say thank you to, to people from Crew 902 who are um, the, the people I did my master's with in Lancaster. Um, there's, there's lots of poems that are in this collection that I've had help with, I've had feedback from those guys and um, this one in particular, I think it sort of contains plants, birds, insects and it's about language as well so it's got all the, the sort of elements of uh, different poems in one here and it's the first poem in the collection um, and there's a little story about the first line of it which I'll tell you at the end it's, it's um, and, and how the poem originated but it, it certainly got finished when we were in our summer school um, on the Lancaster master's degree and um, this this poem's called Murmur. The starling nests in a cup of feathers. The nouns come out like eggs, roosting in the holy synonyms of towns, colonizing common spaces. The bird becomes grammar. In the syntax of grass and pasture, there is a legend spooling wordlessly. Suddenly in the air, a flock of clauses lift and drops like logic, silent over children calling, silent over ears of corn silking by the road, over the wood pigeon's soft choke, in the consonants of trees, over the bee devouring the vowel of a flower. An autumn evening dives. The starlings write a novel on the eggshell of the sky. So if you've ever seen a murmuration, uh, the movement of, of starlings together, you might understand what that amazing sight is like. But the first line of the poem, the starling nests in a cup of feathers. This is perhaps um, a tip for, for people who, who are looking for something to write about. You know, um, my friend Martina before earlier said, you have to devote time to writing. You can't just wait for inspiration to strike if you're ever gonna achieve anything in writing, because you'll just be spending a long time waiting there. But if you if you purposely sit down and make yourself write, then the words will come. And this is one way to, to find out a, an idea to write a poem, which is just to browse and, and read a lot and see what what the world offers you. Um, and, and sometimes we call those found poems. You might find the words already there and they just need some reshaping. But this first line is from the um, RSPB website when I was researching starlings and it says the starling nests in a cup of feathers and I thought well that's a poem waiting to happen right there and uh, took it took it away okay um so potatoes um I re recently just moved back to England and got back to my house and garden that we lived in 13 years ago and the house had been rented out and someone's been living here and obviously it's it's a bit of a mystery, really serious time to be moving out of a, a garden because it's the time when it's giving back all the things that you've put into it. And um, so I was very lucky to inherit some potatoes. Um, they were growing in the garden, so um, we dug those up and ate them. But the, the whole collection's called Unearthed, and there's a poem called Unearthed in the collection. And the story behind this is is my friend Sarah is a gardener and was digging potatoes and she sent me a message saying I'm digging potatoes up you should write a poem about digging up potatoes so um 
I did. And it's nice to have a challenge like that. If Again, you know, these little things make you right. And if someone throws down the gauntlet like that, well, you've got to take it up. So this, this poem came from that idea and I didn't know where it was going to go. There's echoes of it in here that I think point to something perhaps more sad and melancholy, but there is at the, at the bottom of this is the joy of finding potatoes in the soil. Unearthed, sitting gravity under loam. Tubers carve their dark canals to depths of a dagger. All the while they're waxing like moons, nudging out the belly of the earth with elbows, knee joints, hip bones. When the toe urges, the fork lifts and a forcep grip delivers marbles from the dirt into light, into hands that sift for a memory of an unheld child. The birthday brings forth a colony of princes crowned and white as a cluster of skulls, bone rounded, flint chiseled, sculpted like eggs by the ground. How easily knocked out like the shoulder of a bell are the ringing bones of ancestors born of the land from the manifold soil. So a short poem, a nice round compact poem on the page like a potato as well. Um, I'm just checking the time. Do you think I've got time for one more before it's Anna's turn, Janice? Yeah, okay. So so we're, I'm heading back to Singapore and the, there's lots of poems that have connections with Singapore because I think that's where I was taking my master's whilst I was working and I was head of English at, at um, Dulwich there. And so echoes of Singapore uh, life come through the poems quite a lot in this collection um, and you probably know already that the national flower of Singapore is as an orchid and it's called the um, Miss van der Joaquim and my apologies to people in Singapore if I pronounce her surname wrong but I think it's Joaquim and I did quite a lot of research into her um, because she was the, the lady who named the orchid she propagated it and she was not her family were not from Singapore originally so she was a uh, an expatriate if you like and I was as well so I felt like there's sort of a connection there between us on being kind of an outsider in your home and also being a gardener and um, if you really look closely at an orchid they are amazing and uh, there's so much inspiration within the flower itself for actually writing about um and I, so my poem orchid tongue is a little bit about language and speech and and being from somewhere else uh, as, as well as the observation of the orchid itself and i've used the inscription on agnes draquim's grave to begin the poem orchid tongue my hand i bring simply to thy cross i cling inscription on the grave of of Agnes Joaquim, botanist, Singapore. Bound to a tree, a spur beyond the base, rubbery buds like alien pods, tipped with the face of a butterfly, bleating pink in petticoats of perfect symmetry, astonishingly female. The sulky pout attracts the landing bee to fall in love. Armenian daughter, grown here from seed, new breath to the soil of your home. As the colony sprouted new shoots, you raised a silent larynx to speak your name. But Ashken became Agnes, then just Miss. I think of how you would have held the orchis, tender as a testicle. Did you blush and whisper, Zero? Yes, I love you, in the ears of your blooms, like anemones of the sea. Those pink-veined, delicate human throats. Earth cannot anchor such roots that clamour to speak in our emigrant air. And if you're wondering about the word testicle coming in there, if again, look at the etymology of orchid. That's something for you to do for homework, those of you who are listening in Singapore. So there are a few poems about the natural world that have been compacted into this, this little collection. And um, 
I'm going to pass back over to Janice, who I think will introduce my really good friend and partner in rhyme and, uh, a, a, and great writer, uh, Anna. That was a lovely reading. Thank you very much. It, it added Thank so you. much more to the poems. I loved them anyway. I think oh, the starling good. one was the one that made us go, oh, got to have this book. <laughs> it was lovely. Thank you. I love all That's brilliant. Thank on the you. Windowsill. That's what I was looking at. We've got a windowsill that grows orchids. <laughs> oh, wow. So, now we're going to move on to hear from Anna, Anna Teresa Slater, uh, who at the moment is in the Philippines. She's a teacher in the Philippines. She completed her MA in creative writing at Lancaster University. Anna's work is published in a variety of journals such as Channel Lit Magazine, Mag, uh, Ghost City Review, Song of uh, Arets Poetry Review, Shot Glass Review, Nine Muses Poetry, and more, as well as in anthologies by Kassang, Kassing Kassing Press and Hedgehog Press. The ebook version of her first poetry collection, A Singular Spectacular Chore by Kassing Kassing Press, was released in November last year, 2020 with the print version forthcoming this year. So Anna, we're looking forward to hearing your work, your poems. Thank you. Would everybody- Thank you. Stay muted. Thank you, Janice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ruth, for inviting me to this special day. I feel very honored to be here and it's so wonderful to see so many familiar faces as well, especially Crew 902. Uh, you were part of our, of our journey getting here so I'm happy to to be here today so um I just have a few poems that I will be sharing uh from the first one is from my collection and uh yeah I just wanted to read this one because some people who are here today uh like this poem a lot Socrates makes me write about love in fact from what I gather, he is fixed in his position that there are definitions of love hovering around his mat, waiting to drop. He lies by my feet, stares at me or licks his paw until my fingers tap on keys. At times he plays dead. The pressure he puts is subtle. If I gaze at him long enough, scattered thoughts merge in my head. I catch a scent and this leads images closer to where I sit. He tilts his head, barks, and I write. At two in the morning, I have many questions he doesn't answer. As he rolls on the floor in deep, dogged sleep. Socrates does not tell me if he believes in God. He does not tell me if he is just putting up with the cat sprawled on the windowsill. He does not tell me whether he enjoys minced beef, but he eats it. I write and write every day what Socrates wants me to say about love. <laughs> Thank you. So um, this second poem uh, is is fairly new. It came out in an environmental magazine in Ireland, uh, Channel Lit Mag, and it's called The Amateur's Guide to Managing Things. A boy breaks up with a girl, and I am called upon to fix it, as though love was a faucet or a burnt out fuse. Outside my door, <clears throat> a gaggle of geese unleash their wings. Each angry, I presume, at being a goose in a world such as this. The dog howls at the moon that pulls too hard at things meant to stick to the ground. Inside my room, cups of coffee suddenly crave sugar and milk and cheesecake and fathers are more absent than usual. But there is no switch to repair it. This girl doesn't know that sometimes I too, though I'm not sure why, am like an angry goose. This girl may sit beside me, 
Together we shall howl at the round ghosts of the sky. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and yeah, this last poem is, uh, I don't know how much time I still have, but I have, I have a few, but this is one poem that I really wanted to get in. It's the, the newest one, uh, very recent. It's called the, the Resemblance of Lopsided Appendages. Every time I start to forget I was your daughter, I look down at the skew whiff knobs of my fingers each wonky digit sprawled out toward their stubborn destinations. Three spindling to constellations above my head, four peeking outside the window at the arrival of a magnetic breeze, the rest angling forward to things I can't see yet. Years later and the sandalwood scent of your seven pocket vest has faded. Your teared and teary laugh has grown faint, but you are still there when I hand over a 20 to the lady behind the register of 7-Eleven, when I point at protest flashing on the news, when I chop onions, toss them into a warm beef stew, all the while wondering whether grandma was right when she said you were watching from heaven or whether I believe a former lover as he caressed my hair saying, honey, when we dead, we dead. When all that is left of you is the bullheadedness of my knuckles flaring from the daintiest of wrists. I don't know if I understand the science of inheritance all that much. When all that is left of a father are 10 hardy extensions from two palms one will not wonder too long whether the cap of a ketchup bottle will open if one's eyes ever need to look away, whether one will ever again be blindsided by touch. Anna, if Thank you want you. to go on, if you want to go on and read your other two poems, please do. Um, okay, if there is the time okay? Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so I'll just read one more, I think, um, and then just to give a quick, a quick uh, backgrounder, it's, it, I wrote this after my mom and I were riding in our car, uh, going home, and on the road, we suddenly spotted this old man in front of our car uh, driving a unicycle on the road, this very busy road. And he was doing it like it was the most natural thing in the world. And I, that, that image really stuck to me. So I was inspired to write this poem. This is also in my collection and it's what inspired the, the title of my collection. It's called Stranger on the Street. I want the old man on the unicycle to listen to my prayers. Maybe on his way home, his left arm a wand, scribbling gravity spells in the air, his right swinging a blue plastic bag, circling like a gentle carousel, leafy greens erupting from above. Maybe he has got the ripped out pages from the back of the book. Maybe he's the one who holds the instructions to a dragon slayer life. His shirt glittering with holes, shorts cut off above his sunshine knees, slippers with weary soles scrolled over pedals, and his spine so upright one could measure pyramids with it. I wish the old man on the unicycle would teach me how to strip one's second by second existence down to the essence of a singular spectacular chore, or how to fetch vegetables from the corner store without falling over. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. That was very lovely poems. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> and now we're going to hear again from Ruth. Ruth, would you like to unmute and read for us again? Thank you very much. Thank you, Janice. 
Um, I'm really, really privileged to know those poems from sometimes from their infancy as well, because um, Anna and I are, you know, we keep each other in check and we, I think, help have helped each other an awful lot. I know Anna's helped me such a lot with sometimes just a very fledgling idea and, um, you know, she's given me great, great feedback all the time. And as soon as I started reading Anna's work, which was through our tutorials in the, the master's degree, I knew that, that there was a great writer there in her, um, as I did with all the others as well in, in the, the, the crew. But we, Anna and I were the only two who were writing poetry, most of all. Some people were writing some poems, but mostly prose. And um, so Anna and I became very, very close. And, and thank goodness I've still got her there and we can still uh, write and, and share. And those poems are amazing. Um, and I, I'm interested actually to hear about a single spectacular chore, which you should get which is Anna's collection, um, because I always, Anna, I always thought it was about teaching, um, the single spectacular chore of teaching, but of course the unicycle man. I suppose you can probably make many parallels between being a teacher and riding a unicycle whilst carrying the groceries, as all teachers will know. Um, and Anna's poems do often feature her family and friends, her, the life in the Philippines that she lives. And I think that's what many of us do as writers. We, we probably contain a lot of our experiences quite obviously. And um, where we live has such an influence on us, where we're from, who brought us up, who we spend our time when we're young and, and older, um, does have an influence on us. And we write about those connections. And so the other meaning of unearthed for me in the collection was to do with rediscovering I suppose places that I've lived the roots I suppose which is also a, a plant metaphor isn't it but we use it to mean where we're from and also memories as well and sometimes if you're looking for inspiration sometimes a memory can just be the right place to to dig around for finding some material and I'm from um, Haywood in Lancashire actually um, and was very fortunate to have a fantastic English teacher when I was at school doing my O levels and um, I'd recently got in touch with him again uh, and wanted to send him this, this book. Um, and what was great about him, Mr. Bell, I don't know if you're with us today, but uh, I did invite him, but um, was that he encouraged us to interpret for ourselves. And it's something that I've talked to my students about since then, about, you know, never, being, I would never be the person to tell anyone what I think a poem means until they've reached their own conclusion. Anyway, this is relevant, stay with me, because the poem I'm gonna read next is about something to do with Ted Hughes. And we learned poems by Ted Hughes. We read poems by Ted Hughes, specifically his animal poems, and it's had a massive influence on me. Um, so when I was writing, about the process of writing, Ars Poetica, my old students will know, um, I realised that the influence of who you read, especially when you were younger and encountering poems, can stay with you. The influence continues on with you. And so I decided to go for a walk with Ted Hughes, uh, go fishing with him. Um, and I actually have used an inscription, which is by Ted Hughes, which is about writing. And it's about thinking as well. So I'll read that first and then I'll read the poem. It's called Fishing with Ted Hughes. That process of raid or persuasion or ambush or dogged hunting or surrender is the kind of thinking we have to learn. And if we do not somehow learn it, then our minds lie in us like the fish in the pond of a man who cannot fish. That's Ted Hughes. We wade upstream to meet the fishbone hills. Below us, the flat river smooths, waxy across the white and shingle shore. The clarity of stones pebbling by mills. Down there, ideas like star bright salmon kink their thrust, twist, land flat on the water spout and minnows hinting glimmer flick and plummet at the brink. But here, the mute pool plunges deep and a single ripple murmurs under its breath 
like the heavy door to creation creaking, or the handshake where two seasons meet. We stand in foot clumps on the muddied bank. The pond full gaunt lines of thought. An eel might bite and not itself. The wet coil of a snake on trial gets swagged back. We could witness the notion of a trout hauled up on amber spray, my fingernail lifting rainbows in a tiny scale. When at last, from the clouded mind, the ancient pike grins out. So if you don't know the poem Pike by Ted Hughes, you should probably read that. Um, as I mentioned before um, about uh, Anna's single spectacular chore of being a teacher, of course, all those of us who teach, we are often inspired by our students as well. Um, and this next poem is based on a real event, a little encounter in a library, um, in the very library that I think some people might be there, in there now in Dulwich College, Singapore. Um, and it was just something about how we can learn from our students. So this memory became pinned down into this poem. And I wanted to read it because I wanted to say hello to everyone over in Dulwich and who I miss. And uh, hopefully they're listening today. It's called Paid Insult. In the library, a girl, often hushed, sits flicking through a hardback, her feet not quite reaching the ground. I ask if she's found something valuable in her book, but she doesn't respond. I nearly move on, but she says, they used to pay people with salt. We peer at the pictures of times before money, first civilizations joined by a map of the salt road, salination, the value of trade, preservation, our eyes on this same page. Then she passes me the crystal. It's where we get the word salary from. I hadn't known. I face her like Mrs. Lott and stare. This is how it is in nonfiction. She doesn't look up. She just turns to the chapter on tea, unaware. And unaware of, of the impact that that little encounter had on me, I think. Um, and thank goodness for libraries and librarians and English teachers as well. And uh, in my in my thank yous at the back of the book, I, I say we are paid in salt, <laughs> whatever that means. But um, we do learn from our students as well, and we appreciate them. So moving is a difficult and <laughs> exhausting task. Um, and many of you listening there today have probably moved at some point in your life, whether it's down the street to a different house or across the world to a different country. And um, I've just recently moved again and, and leaving people behind is never, never easy. Um, but there is still the thrill and the excitement of going on to new things. And um, this next poem is uh, another memory of when me and my husband, Jeff, moved from Sheffield, where we lived after being students and got married and had our house. And we were going overseas. We were going to Pattaya. And I think maybe some people listening today who we were there with. And um, so we, once again, had to pack away the things that we'd, we'd built around ourselves and, um, and move. And so this is about that. And this is the a title, probably the longest title in of any of my poems. It's called Driving Over the Snake Pass Under a Shed with a Goldfish on My Lap. So I'll just, just tell you very briefly, if you don't know what Snake Pass is, it's a road uh, and it joins Sheffield and Manchester. Lots of towns in between as well, but it's notoriously windy and it can easily get cut off with snow. Um, so the Snake Pass was the route that we used to take. Me being from Manchester, um, we, I used to drive that quite often when I was a student and then afterwards when I lived in Sheffield. So this is the, the journey over the Snake Pass with the shed and the goldfish. These were the final items to repatriate, taken over the hills to my first home. The cats had gone ahead 
two weeks before. Young enough to still depend on parents, we knew the baggage that we did not take could be left at their door and kept for us. Tied to the roof rack like a tortoise shell, the shed, unconstructed, was just boards of wood. I peered skyward as you drove for any shift in light, foreshadowing some avalanche of splinters. We kept the radio off, tuned in to creaking and the steady slosh of fish water that I was powerless to stop. We had no idea how our life would be rebuilt a thousand miles away. Or why fish, when moved into some larger water, grow? And you'll be pleased to know that the fish that I took over to my mum and dad's pond lived to a ripe old age in their pond. Um, I'm going to read one more because then we want some time for any questions and answers. And so, you know, when you're a writer and lots of people out there are, you know how hard it is. It's hard work. I mean, I have such respect for people who can write lengthy prose. I know some friends who are, who are novelists and it's, and st short stories even. I cannot generate that many words. <laughs> um, so how you do it, I don't know, but it equally it takes a long time to write a poem and usually you know there, you go through many many drafts and um, you're just searching for the exact words quite often or the exact punctuation or the exact line turn and shape on the page there's many things that you could keep crafting away at and it takes an awful long time and most people's poems I would say have come, gone through that difficult process however Every now and again, you are, I think, handed a, a bit of a gift of a poem, which comes almost fully formed. Um, and this poem was one of those. It, I did very, very little to it after I wrote it down immediately after I'd had the idea. And it was a, a morning. I woke up with it in, in my mind and wanted to write it. And so for those of you who do write, this is a reason why you should have a little notebook and a pen by your bed, because ideas for poems like dreams, they can evaporate very, very quickly if you don't pin them down. And so this poem, if you, you can now try a sort of winter time, um, snowy time in, in a sort of England landscape. This is, a, this is an actual memory of mine from being young and it's about my family. And it's called The Snow Hulk. I'm in the front. Mum sits behind with both my sleeping sisters flaked from old Lang Syne. Snow scraps hurl like curls of peel, fling themselves into the windscreen. I can't believe how secret the cautious clotted streets appear. The year is closing, the world's transforming. Our garden, dressed like a stage set, awaits. The idea takes, we're piling, shoveling we are like frenzied frankensteins intent but this snowman is only half monster arms bent in rage and towering so i can't reach to hang his hat we sometimes thought of you like that you lift me up to press his coal black eyes i prayed he wouldn't melt building a snowman, building a snow hulk in the garden. That one's about, of course. So there's a taster of some of the uh, collection. And um, I've, I've really enjoyed the chance to read them, actually. I hope you've enjoyed listening. And um,